great in 2008. Expect something great in 2008. It has been rumored that there was a certain husband who had approached his wife and asked her a simple question. What do you want for Christmas? And he had been sort of talking about how commercial the Christmas season was and it was over-commercialization and Christ was being lost and all this type of business. And his wife had listened very tentatively, very closely to all of that discussion. So finally, she decided to give him a spiritual answer. She said, well, just read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And just do that for me for Christmas. And so he got the Bible and he read it. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly of all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He knew at that moment he was getting ready to be bankrupt <laughs> because his wife's expectation was that he would do exceeding abundantly of all that she had asked or thought. <laughs> and he realized he would have been much better off in the beginning if he just took his medicine like a man. See, just gave her the credit card and took it like a man because now he was in a no-win situation. But so it is as we try to serve our God. We underestimate him. We underestimate him. And we underestimate what he wants to do in and through us and what he desires to do in and through us and the places he wants to lift us to. So I want to talk just briefly as to why and how and what we have to do to prepare ourselves to expect something great in 2008. Most Christians really don't expect for God to do anything significant. We're just satisfied just trying to get by. But God wants to put his glory and his power, his majesty and his grace on display through our lives. But God restricts himself to our faith. So if we have a little faith, then God will only work in little ways in our lives. But if we will expand our faith to believe God and to trust God, then God is able to fill our faith. And the text says he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. How do we get there? How do we get to the point to where we are ready to receive God doing something that could exceed in an abundant way, that God could overflow anything that we could ever think about or ever ask him to do. How do we get there? How do we prepare ourselves for that? I'm going to give you about five words, simple words. The first one I want to give you is perspective. Perspective. A powerful word. The power of perspective. Our perspective is limited by our experiences. So those things that we have experienced and that our minds have processed and that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our noses have smelt and our mouths have tasted, those experiences, they shape our perspective. And so we see things through a certain perspective. Now I got this little collection up here. And uh, it's growing every day. It's not helping me one bit. When I put on these glasses, I see things in one perspective. And somebody might want to claim them today. <laughs> when I put on these, it's a whole different perspective. As a matter of fact, some of y'all grow this way with one set, and others grow this way with another set. It's all about perspective. And when I put on these, it's a total different because they got bifocals. So, I mean, people are raised up and going down like they're changing in size as we go. It's the lens of what I look through. And these right here just must be somebody's, I'm going to be cute glasses because they just kind of look the same. So, <laughs> someone might want to come and collect the glasses. I'm just collecting. I got four pairs up here. I can't see another one. But the glasses, the lens, it shapes the perspective in terms of how we see things. 
So what God wants to do is God wants to change our perspective. And the way God changes our perspective is that God changes our perspective by stretching our minds to where we can imagine things from a different perspective because of an experience and an encounter with God through the word of God that God has given to us. Now back up to Ephesians chapter 1, and that's what Paul does in the book of Ephesians. He's trying to help these Gentile Christians understand that even though they have been viewed by the Jews, the religious people, as being the outscouring of the world, as been absolutely nothing, Paul wants them to gain a different perspective of themselves now that they are in Christ. And so Paul opens up in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, by saying, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blame, without blame before him, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, where he has made us accepted in the beloved. Now I could go on. Paul is trying to change the perspective of these Ephesian folk who had been pagan, who had been idolatrous, they had been immoral, they had been wicked, they had stole, they had used drugs and narcotics. That was a major part of the religious system in Ephesus. They would get high on drugs and narcotics and then engage in gross sexual morality thinking they were getting closer to God. And they were coming out of this type of filth and trash and decadent lives and many people were telling them, y'all ain't nothing still. But Paul says, no, let me show you a different perspective, that in Christ you have been lifted up into heavens. You're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. Your salvation is already assured because of the work of Christ. And as a matter of fact, before the foundation of the world, God looked through the corridors of time, and he saw you at a place in time, and God decided to create certain situations and circumstances that we brought to bear on your life that would cause your heart to be humble and it will cause you to repent and want to change and that God has already predestined you to the adoption of sons that changes your perspective once we get God's perspective of us in terms of how God now sees us through the lens of the blood of Christ it then helps us to see things from God's perspective we've had our experiences and many of us are still living with guilt and we're living with shame and we're living with hurt, and we're living with pain, and we're living with frustration because of past failures. And those records are still playing in our head where someone told us, you're not nothing. You want a mountain and thing. Your mama wasn't nothing. Your daddy wasn't nothing. You come from nothing. And that still plays over in our minds. And there are times in time in our lives we fail and we fall short of what we want to be, of what we expect from ourselves, of where we want to go. And then that record starts playing over and over and again. But the way we're able to kick that arm on that record player and move that thing forward is we understand God's perspective. That God sees us totally differently than the way others may see us and the way we may even see ourselves. And we have to learn to believe what God has to say about us and let the thought that God has for us Fill our minds and change our perspective. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Paul right into the church at Colossae, and they were a similar people. We sometimes want to make the people in the Bible pristine and pure and clean, and they would do all these wonderful things. No, these people were sinners. They were just rank sinners, and there's absolutely nothing in the world that has been done today that these people were not doing during that time. There's nothing new under the sun. As I shared with you before, we now just can videotape it, digitize it, DVD it, and then download it to the web and broadcast it to the world. But they were doing the same thing, and God would send Paul and other Christians into these tough places, and the gospel would be preached, and people would turn to God from this wickedness and from this decadence, and they would trust Jesus Christ. But their minds were still filled with the past and all these past experiences, and now what God is doing through Paul as he writes the word of God is to help people gain a different perspective of where they now are in Christ. 
So in Colossians chapter 3, hear what Paul says. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Paul says, now that you understand what has happened in the spiritual realm, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, all of your sins, think about that. And we need to meditate on that. We're so in a hurry to move to the glory land that we need to think about what that really means, that all the sins that we committed knowingly, cognitively, we were aware of it. All the things that we have done, God knew that we would commit all those sins, but God still loved us in Christ. And he still sent Jesus Christ to live the perfectly sinless life that we could not live. Then be betrayed and then to be pinned to the cross so that his blood could be shed, so that he could pay the price, the punishment, the ransom, so that he could accept the judgment that we all deserve. That's enough to shout about right there. Because it is guilt and it is shame that often haunts us and it robs us of the joy of today and it steals our tomorrow because we're always questioning and we're doubting whether or not we're really worthy of the best that God has to offer to us. And the cross of Calvary is God's declaration. At time in history, I declare you to be worthy of the best that heaven has to offer because I've set my love upon you. Now Paul is lifting us to say, understand, you've already been raised spiritually into heavenly places with Christ. So now seek those things. Seek heavenly things. So perspective then leads to the right attitude. The right attitude. We don't have the right attitude. We don't have the right attitude. There's a saying that says that attitude determines altitude. Uh, where your attitude is will determine how high you can rise because people will respond to you based on your attitude. Well, I can, also, I can agree with that but I, f I also think that it, altitude can change attitude. <laughs> Once we understand our altitude of where we are in Christ, then that can start to change our attitude. And that's what Paul is saying. We ought to want to live better, act better, think better, and to do better because of our altitude, because of where we are in Christ. And we want our attitude in time, our attitude on the earth, to reflect the fact that in Christ, we set in heavenly places. So if we're going to be able to expect God to do something great in 2008, we got to get the right perspective. And we've got to get the right attitude to understand the altitude that we are in Christ. And God wants us to start to reach for and reach up for that which he has called us to be. Are you listening to me? We have to think more seriously about our purpose. Why did God place me here? Why am I on the earth? Why am I on the planet? Your employment, your job is not your purpose. That's your job. And that's the way God has chosen to meet your needs and the needs of your family. And that's wonderful. But it's in the context of that job you also find what is my purpose. What is my purpose? And my purpose has to be connected some kind of way to the Great Commission. If you want to find your purpose, then you, you look at your job and then you try to understand how is my job connected to the Great Commission? How is my job connected or how can my job be connected to telling people about Christ or praying for people or trying to encourage people to grow in their faith, to grow in their discipleship? Are you following me? I, once we get the right perspective, and our attitude has changed, we then begin to realize that God has called us to be a part of his program, and so our preeminent ambition in life ought to try to fulfill the purpose for which God has left us here. And our purpose will always be connected in some way, directly or indirectly, to the purpose that God has for the church. Are you listening to me? The purpose that God has for the church is that the church, the body of Christ, will be the continuation of the life of Christ on the earth. And that the church, the continuation of the life of Christ, will share the good news of the gospel, the grace of God, calling men and women and boys and girls to repent and put their faith in Christ. That's what God is up to. That's what God is all about. 
And so God sprinkles us as Christians. He sprinkles us all over the place because God wants to have a presence everywhere people are gathered together. And so some of you are sprinkled. Brother Chuck Overstreet, he's sprinkled over there in the fire station. So he's a captain at the fire station. So, Paul, so God can show firemen what he would look like if he was a captain at the fire station. So Brother Chuck's challenge is how do I live out my faith in the context of being in this environment in close proximity with men and women on a day-to-day -day basis so they can see what God actually looks like in real time. Others, you are sprinkled in the school system. Sprinkled in the medical profession, sprinkled in the hospitals, sprinkled in colleges and universities, but we are there so that we can live out our faith to the glory of God and people can see that God is still actively involved in the affairs of people. Are you listening to me? If the church catches this vision, understand that we are not the church because we come together. We come together because we are the church. We come together because we are the church, and we come together to make visible what cannot be seen when we are not together. But we are always of the church, and by design, God calls us from sundry and divers and various backgrounds to make us a complete body, and that we are unique, and that we can have an appeal to a broad range and diverse group of people in real time, in life, where life is really making up its mind in the crucible of everyday living. And so what God does is God enters into our everyday mundane lives. And sometimes it appears to be mundane, it appears to be repetitious and almost insignificant, but God is always building a platform, creating a forum, and then on a particular day, everything is gone before was for that time that God would give you the chance to really be a witness for Christ and a way to show people the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. But we got to be expecting God to do something. I believe that God longs, God yearns, and God is waiting for the church to start expecting him to do something by having the faith to believe that he can and that he will, and by putting ourselves in situations and circumstances to where God has to do what only God can do. Perspective, attitude, and altitude. Thirdly, we got to rediscover our spiritual confidence. Our confidence. The church has lost her confidence. The church has lost her confidence in the power of the word of God. The church has lost her confidence in the power of the spirit of God to change and to transform people's lives. And when you don't have confidence, then you are not willing to try things. You become very conservative. I had a lengthy conversation this morning with a lady on the radio. We were talking about what's happening to kids and this, that, and the other. And she was telling me about her frustration. She tried to reach out to kids, and they don't want to do this, and they don't want to do that. She can't get into it. I said, you know what the problem is? Spirit is broken. The spirit of this generation of children, many of their spirits have been broken, and their spirits were broken very early in life. Their spirit was broken because they were born into a family where there, weren't, there wasn't the nurture that they really needed, the support, the type of encouragement. No one established the foundation. No one set boundaries. No one had an expectation. The spirit are broken because no one put a hedge around a lot of these kids and to try to protect them from as much as you could protect them from until they were old enough and mature enough to be able to deal with some of the adult subject matter. So the spirits are broken at an early age because they're overexposed to things. They haven't been nurtured. They haven't been disciplined. And they haven't really been effectively reared and trained. And their spirits are broken. And so they're overwhelmed by life, and they don't have the confidence to believe that they really can get things done, so they just opt out to acting out to doing what they know they can do, and that's act a fool. The spirits are broken. And so the church has to be that agent of God to try to restore the spirit that has been broken, the spirits of our children that have been broken. Are you listening to me? we got to try to lift the spirit and try to help them gain, regain spiritual confidence. 
And so that comes, that's why I'm so committed to trying to get these young people into Sunday school and discipleship because I believe the ministry of the Word of God and prayer and support for caring adults can once again help kids feel like they are valued and like they're supported and like they're not facing the world all by themselves. Are y'all listening to me? They're not facing the world all by themselves. There's someone there trying to stand in the gap. There's someone that's serving as their champion. But the same thing has happened to adults. Children with broken spirits, they grow up to be adults with broken spirits. They grow up to be adults who lost their confidence, who lost their sense of value, and lost their sense of worth. And so when you're the young girl who grows up in that situation with a broken spirit, with a, not a good sense of value and sense of worth, she is likely to get in a relationship to where she's going to be abused and she's going to accept the abuse because she thinks, I don't deserve anything any better than that. Can I talk to y'all in real time? See, we've got to get off all this spiritual stuff. Real time is we've got a lot of young females who are trapped in abusive relationships that's destructive to them. Then they give birth to children, and they bring children into a situation where there's an abusive relationship. And so the children's spirit is broken at an even earlier age, and this pathology just metastasizes, you see. Broken spirits. And so we reconnect kids, and we reconnect these single mothers to a caring community. I've been trying to create this dialogue on the radio uh, this year. Martin Luther King was living, he had been 79 years old, I believe, on January the 15th. In April, he would have been 80 years old. So I raised the question, what would Martin Luther King say if he was allowed to come back? What questions would he raise? What observations would he make? And I think one of the first ones he would make, he would say, where's all the fathers? How did we get so many fatherless children from since I left here? Because when King left the planet, in 1968, 75 to 80% of all African-American children were in two-parent households. 85 to 90% of all white children were in two-parent households. That's what a community looked like in 1968. In 2008, 80% of all black kids in this town are born in single female head household. It, it, it doesn't even look like anything that we could think it would happen over a 40 year period. That would be an issue. That's why we've got to try to connect these kids. We've got to try to connect them to caring relationships with caring people who know God and who are praying for these children and praying and ask God to put a hedge around these children because if we don't do that, they grow up with a spirit that is broken. A spirit that is broken is a spirit that turns into a bitter spirit, an angry spirit, a resentful spirit, a violent spirit. And so you see this violence being pressed down, violence being pressed down in our community at an earlier and an earlier age. The real antidote for violence is caring adults, establishing foundations and boundaries and expectations and nurturing and disciplining, you see. And that's why the church has a role to play. So I'm appealing to you guys. I'm appealing to you. You don't realize how broken your spirit is. You don't realize how damaged your spirit is. You don't realize how hurt your spirit has been because we learn to cope with it, you see. Over time, our coping mechanism set in so we become defensive and so many of us, we just don't trust nobody. We don't trust anyone because the people we were supposed to have trusted, they violated that trust. Adults giving kids alcohol, adults exposing kids to drugs, adults opposing kids to fornication and to uh, other type of vile, wicked stuff. Adults abusing children. So now we go through life, we ain't trusting nobody. And that's where we learn how to cope. We learn how to cope with the pain and the disappointment and the brokenness of our spirit by trying to build up an internal defense system and mechanism to whereby we don't want to connect with anybody at a real intimate relationship level because it's too risky. The only problem with that is that God made us to be connected in relationships. We are wired to function best in relationship. No man is an island. No man lives unto himself. We need caring, nurturing, loving relationships, building into our lives. They affirm our dignity. They affirm our worth. They affirm our value. We need relationships. And that's why I believe God left the church here. God left the church 
so there would be at least one place where people could come back and connect in caring, nurturing relationships. God left the church where there would be a community of people whose spirits had been broken and they would be able to come to a place and have their spirit renewed and their spirit refreshed and they would be strengthened. But because they've been hurt so deeply and scarred so severely, they would always have a tender spirit. A tender spirit for the broken spirit for the bruised spirit, for the crushed spirit. Read Luke chapter 4. And what Jesus says is really, really kind of interesting. When Jesus steps onto the scene to launch his public ministry, he goes to the synagogue as it was his custom. They gave him book, the book to read, and it was found in the place of Isaiah. And he stood there on that day to be the fulfillment of this prophetic word. And in Luke chapter 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Luke 4, 18. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus says those whose heart has been broken because of betrayal, because of disappointment, having been let down, having been betrayed, he has sent me to bring healing, to bring healing. So I just want to stop by this morning and say to many of you, if not all of you, your heart has been broken, your spirit has been bruised, you've carried it around for a long time wondering whether or not you could ever get the victory, ever get deliverance. Can this hurt ever go away? Let's expect in 2008 that God is do, going to do something great and God is going to bring healing to your broken spirit so that you can stand up and give a testimony of what God has done for you. How God has healed you from the spirit that was broken that caused you to be angry and you didn't know what you were angry about or who you were angry at. Perspective, attitude, confidence. And when the spirit is renewed and the spirit is revived, then our confidence starts to stir back up inside of us. We are valued. I am important. God hasn't forgotten me. There is a place for me. God does have a plan for me. I do matter. My life counts. It has value. I'm not some accident just here trying to find something to do with my time. Well, let me wrap this up. The next word that I want to share with you is energy. A dual word, energy and enthusiasm. Energy and enthusiasm, because I want to stir you up this year. I want you to find what is your passion. What is your passion? When you find passion, then your energy is stirred. Your enthusiasm is stirred up. You're passionate about doing something. And I believe the perspective and the attitude and the confidence starts to stir inside of us, and our spiritual juices starts to stir, and so our energy and our enthusiasm start to swell up inside of us, and we now start seeing difficult situations, not as merely obstacles and problems, but they become opportunities for God to put his glory on display. You see, Energy, enthusiasm. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, be confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God, it is the dunamis of God, it is the energy of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. You see, And right there in Ephesians 3.20, Paul says, Now that he was able to do exceeding abundantly of all that you could ask or think according to the power. And that word there in the Greek text for, for power, it is a dual word that's put together that speaks of energy doing work. Energy doing work. And so when God stirs up inside of you, there is energy and there is enthusiasm because you believe in God is doing something great. And I want to be a part of what God is doing is great. And I believe that God wants to do something great in and through my life. That's what we want to expect God for in 2008, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the last word I want to give you is spirit. And we've already touched on that. And it culminates with the healing of the spirit.
the healing of the Spirit. And very often we don't understand that. You know, I'm privileged to be able to move in and out of these worlds. And I listen to people talking, and we have these kids in the juvenile justice system, and so we put them over here, and we put them in this group, and we put them in this group, and we put them in that group, and we take them through this, and we take them through that, and we have this psychiatrist, and this psychologist, and this sociologist, and we do this cycle, so, and we go through all that process, and they're no better because no one is dealing with the spirit. How do we deposit in the people's spirit? We deposit in the people's spirit by deeds of kindness and love and sacrifice. And by doing that, we are depositing in the people's spiritual accounts with their spirit that has been broken is being healed. The spirit that has been depleted now is being restored. And it's, it's a great mystery. It's a great mystery how, how it works. But it only works in the context of caring, nurturing relationships, you see. Let me close with this one passage. In uh, the book of Philippians, I believe, In Philippians chapter 1, look what Paul says, and I want to pick up uh, the narrative in verse 17. Paul says, but that, but but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding, whether every way, whether in practice or in pretense, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yea, what I shall choose, I will not. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with, all your, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by coming to you again. And look at the last, the last verse is where I want to get to, and I want to go ahead and wrap this thing up. He says, for unto you it is given, verse 29, in the, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in, in, on him, but also to suffer for his sake having seen the same conflict which you now saw in me and now here to be in me. Read that whole chapter and you'll get a, a context of what Paul is saying. Then in the midst of all of this struggle, in the midst of all of this pain, in the midst of all of this deep hurt and deep disappointment, but because of our relationship with God and because God is restoring our spirit and God is strengthening us on the inside, you see, we find this exhilaration in serving God. So the things that ought to crush us, they serve to energize us. And they serve to cause our enthusiasm and our energy to swell up inside of us even more so that we want to serve God. So I just want to challenge you all this morning to, to consider a new perspective. Let God work on your attitude and rebuild your confidence and your energy and let God restore your spirit and be committed to trying to touch the lives of other people because God ministers to, through us to other people. And he ministers through us by the Holy Spirit to touch the spirit of another person so that everybody's spirit is being nurtured. Everybody's spirit is being restored. And then one day you just wake up and you just kind of feel better. And you don't know how it happened. One day you wake up and you realize, hey, things are going to work out. God has not abandoned me. God has not forgotten me. 
things are going to, things are going to work out. So I want to encourage you this morning to set your face like a flint and be determined that today and every day I'm going to expect something great. I'm going to expect God to hear my prayer. I'm going to respect, expect God to, to touch my life and to open the doors that I need to have open that I might serve him and honor him and be a witness and a testimony to his grace. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who can lift us to a higher plane to give us a new perspective of how things really are. And the one, Lord, that can cause the melancholy, indifferent attitude to be turned around and to restore our confidence and to fill us with the Spirit of God that stirs our energy and enthusiasm and that ministers to our broken spirits, thereby setting a pace for us, a pace for us to, to walk and to run and to serve you. And I pray, Lord, that this first Sunday in January will be a new, a new day, this year, a new year, that we will all be renewed in our commitment to you and our devotion to you, Lord, allow you to stir us, that you might indeed work in through us to do something great this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed and while the musicians prepare to minister softly music, maybe the